good morning and welcome back to our third episode of Primary Nature Live 2021. I'm starting to see lots of familiar names appearing in the YouTube live chat. So a huge welcome back to those of you who have joined us before last week. To those of you who haven't joined us before, my name is Lou and this little guy who the reason I ended up looking down is because actually he's just weed everywhere. This is Angus, my tortoise, and I work for the Field Studies Council, sometimes known as the FSC. Now we're an environmental education charity that run field centres across the UK, the kind of place that you might go on a trip with your school. Just going to put Angus down in case he decides to wee all over the desk again, put him in his box for a minute. Um, so you are joining me currently live at one of those centres. I'm at Juniper Hall, where I'm really excited to say we've had lots of snow. So this is what Juniper Hall looked like about two hours ago. And since then, we have had absolutely loads more. So all those grassy patches, I imagine, won't be there anymore when I go outside a bit later. If you've had any snow where you are, let us know in the YouTube live chat. And if you've built anything like a snowman, again, we'd love to know. Now, on today's episode, we'll be joining Phil at FSC Preston Montford, which is in Shropshire and is very, very close to where famous naturalist Charles Darwin was born. Um, today's lesson is not about Charles Darwin. Uh, with Phil and myself, it's all about the magical and mysterious world of ponds. Phil is going to be taking us through a pond dip where he's going to be showing us some of the interesting things that he has found. And then he's also going to show us how we could make our own pond or like mini pond at home or at school so you could do your own pond dip later on in the year. But before we get too focused on ponds, let's see who's joining us today. So for our first round of shout outs then, we've got Toby from Buxted in East Sussex. So that's not too far from Juniper. Um, we've got Vincent in year one from St. Margaret's Academy. We've got Freya from Palm Bay Primary. Oh, we've got year six from Holland Junior School and welcome back to Giles Brook Primary School as well. We are joined by Mrs Upsall and all of Holly Class from Western Hills Primary School, which is up in Spalding in Lincolnshire. Now, some of you have got your parents to send us in some of the work that you have been doing from our last lesson. So as a reminder, our last lesson was with Kaylee and was all about birds. Now, one of the pictures I'm going to show you that we were sent in is this one here. This is from Bringhurst Primary. And as you can see here in this picture, if I bring it a little bit closer and hold it still, they have all got their bird feeder ingredients ready and are watching Kaylee do it on the board. And they got to make some lovely bird feeders. I hope the birds have been enjoying those. The next thing I've got oh, is actually two pictures. Okay, so here we've got a lovely bird feeder that's made out of a milk bottle. And we have got a completed worksheet with some lovely annotations on. Now those are both by Isabel and Max from Trelales Primary. That looks like a really good bird feeder. It's got a really good perch for those birds to sit on. So hopefully you'll get lots of different things visiting. And I'm really impressed with the, um, annotations that you've put on these. We've got Blackbird weighs as much as a two pound coin. There you are. And another one I'm gonna show, I'm not gonna show all of them because we were sent in loads, but this one here is from Angela and she has sent in this picture and has shown us all the different stages that she's had to make her little lard ball down there. But as you can see, she's got an amazing bird feeder in her back garden. So hopefully she'll be seeing lots over the next few weeks. I have to say, I have made another one, another one of those bird feeders that you guys all made, put it out yesterday and because it's snowing, there's not a huge amount of food out there for the birds and they've gone absolutely bonkers over it. So well done if you've put some bird feed out for the birds. Sorry if I keep looking that way, I keep looking at the snow, I'm really excited by it. So as in the previous two episodes, you can all join in with us in a few ways. The first way is by signing up on our website and downloading the resource pack for this lesson. So the one that Phil and I are gonna be talking about today looks like this one. If you haven't got this resource pack, don't worry. If you head over to the Field Studies Council website and under Primary Nature Live, you can get an adult to sign up for you and you'll be emailed all of these resources for you to do later. The other way that you can get involved is through the YouTube chat. So if you have any good questions about ponds or would like a shout out, pop that in there and I'll try and do those later on. 
Now to use the live chat, you will need a YouTube account. So you will need an adult to help you. Remember really importantly that you must treat today's live chat for today's lesson like you would do if you were in your classroom at school with your teacher. So I expect to only see the sort of comments or questions that you would ask in a classroom at school. I was super impressed with how most of you acted last lesson and we had some really, really good questions in. So please keep that up. We've got some of my colleagues joining us in the chat too. So they will be keeping an eye on those comments and questions coming in and will be helping me answering some of those live. Now, most of you will know that throughout our five live lessons, we are running a competition. In each episode, there will be a letter of the alphabet to spot. And if you watch every single episode, you'll collect all of the letters which you need to, like you need to resort them and it will spell out a secret word. At the end of today's episode, we will pop all the details you need to know on how to enter the competition and a winner will be picked at random. Now I showed you all in the last lesson what it is you could win. And we have got all of the keys that we use in all of our live videos for our identification keys and a little um, like work pack as well, okay? Um, as well as the competition, we also have our I Spy game. So this is where you need to keep your eyes peeled for Phil's favourite cuddly toy and the FSC logo. Once you spot these, you can check them off in your welcome pack and make sure you write down that all important letter. So what we're going to do now is we're going to head up north from here to a very chilly Preston Montford to see what Phil can find hiding in the Preston Montford pond. Thanks Lou. Hi, I'm Phil, one of the tutors here at FSC Preston Monthford. And this is one of a series of ponds we have here at our centre, which we use for visiting school groups. And they love to come and investigate the wildlife in our pond. Let's go and have a look. to do a quick pond dip now to see what's living in here and you might think that ponds are only really teeming with life during the warm months but actually they're also a great place for creatures to hunker down during winter today we're going to be looking for creatures that are called invertebrates but what is an invertebrate i hear you ask well an invertebrate is a creature that doesn't have a backbone these are normally really quite small um, and we can find them living in this pond. Invertebrates um, are also found on land, such as snails and spiders, which you might have seen in your garden or maybe even in your house. To go pond different by yourself, there's a few things you'll need. A net, it doesn't need to be as, as posh as this, it just can be a rock pooling nest you might see by the beach a tray, an ID guide, and of course, a responsible adult. You also need to remember that water can be dangerous. Make sure that you don't do this alone, that you go with a responsible adult, and that you get permission to use the pond first if it's not your own pond. We'll be showing you how to make a very small pond for yourself a little bit later on. So don't worry if you can't get to a pond like this. So I'm going to fill this tray up with water now so that the invertebrates have a good environment for them to go into when I take them out of the pond. The white tray also means that I'll be able to see those creatures much better. Make sure that you're careful when you're filling up your tray with water to keep low down so that you don't fall in and you want to fill it between half and two thirds full with water. And I'm just going to carefully bring it back onto our jetty. 
Right, now we're actually going to do the pond dipping. For this, I'm gonna take this pond net and do a figure of eight motion in the water, getting as much as I can. I'll then take it out of the water and move it quickly to the tray and deposit the contents in the tray. It's really important that we are moving quickly from the water to the tray because the invertebrates that are in the water need to be in the water to breathe. So here we go. I'm carefully doing that figure of eight motion. And I'm gonna bring it out of the water. And turn it upside down. I'm gonna dab the net a couple of times just to make sure, and I'm doing that on both sides, that as many of the invertebrates are gonna come out of the net and into my little pond that I've created in the tray. Let's put this to the side and see what we've got. Okay, let's now have a look at what we managed to catch. And this is fantastic. We have a lot of swimming invertebrates in here. They're all going around happily. I'm gonna try and use this scoop to gently get one of them into a pallet I've got so that I can look more closely at it. And make sure it's nice and gentle. I'm not hurting the invertebrate and then pour it gently into the pot. And now we can have a closer look at what we caught. Right, now I've got a couple of invertebrates into my palette. We're gonna have a go at identifying them so we know what it is that we've got. To do that, I'm gonna use an ID guide. This ID guide is pretty straightforward to use. It asks questions which just answer yes or no and it then points you on to another question. And then we can follow these questions to work out what we've got. So, my first question, does it live in a case or shell? When I'm looking at this right here, there's no case or shell. Does it have legs? Yes, it does have legs. So I'm gonna carry on. Does it have jointed legs? A jointed leg is like your leg and my leg, it bends with a joint, like an elbow or a, or a knee. I suppose elbows are arms. Um, does it have more than six jointed legs? Well, I can look at this and I can see that it has, that it has a six. So the answer is no, it doesn't have more than six. Does it have one or more tails? I'm looking at the end of our invertebrate and no, it has no tails. So on to the next question. Does it run or skate on the surface? No, again. Can you see body segments on the back of its abdomen? So the abdomen is, is it basically, it's made the main bit of its body. The answer is no. And do the wings overlap diagonally? Look at this close up and you will see a diagonal line running across the back. This is the wing case which covers the wings. And so yes, the wings do overlap diagonally. The next question is does it swim on its back? Well, as you're looking at this, you can see the legs rowing it around. And I can see it's shiny back facing me, so no, it's not swimming on its back. That means it's a lesser water boatman. If it did swim on its back, it'd be a greater water boatman. And they are, they're, as well as also swimming on their back, they're also much bigger. So quite clearly I've got a lesser water boatman. And they are a fantastic insect. We have quite a lot of them in our 
um, pond here, and there is a wonderful sight to see. A little more really intriguing invertebrates here. Um, it looks like something from another world, I think, when I, whenever I see this. So I'm going to go through that key again. I'm going to think about whether it lives in a shell, which it definitely does not. Um, and it definitely has legs. I can see them on the side of its, of its quite long body. And it has jointed legs. They're moving around right now, carrying its body forward. It has six legs, so it doesn't have more than six legs. Does it have one or more tails? And yes, definitely, this is a key identifying feature of this particular species, is that it has more, a tail. Does it have more than one tail? Yes. Does it have two tails? No. Are the tails longer than the width of the body? Yes. Are there thin? Are the tails thin and hairy? The body often with gills along each side. Now gills are kind of what some underwater creatures use to, we would say breathe, we probably mean respire, but it's how they, it's how they live underwater. Um, and the answer to that question, I'm going to have to look really quite closely at this, is no. So we've got a damselfly nymph. Now I look at this very closely because there's two pictures of a damselfly nymph here. Um, and I want to work out whether I've got a true damselfly or a demoiselle. Now the picture of the true damselfly, all three of the tails are really quite flat. And if I look at this, all three of the tails are very flat, whereas the demoiselle, its middle tail, is quite pointy. So I think we've got a true damselfly here. Okay, look, now we've got two more species in this little pot. Um, I didn't reckon, realise one of them was in there. Um, I was only going after one, after one particular species, but the other has, has come in along with it, and it's very good at hiding itself. And you'll see why in just a minute. So I'm going to start here again. Does it live in a case or a shell? The answer to this is yes. Then the next, is the case made out of leaves, twigs, sand or stones? Now, the answer again is yes. So we have a cased caddisfly larvae. And from the pictures, you'll be able to see exactly why it was. I didn't actually notice it was there at first because it looks just like a bunch of leaves and twigs that have been abandoned. Very small. But the case caddisfly larvae, it, it creates this little home almost out of it. Because you know like a turtle has its shell, a snail has a shell, kind of like that, but it, it, it creates that all around itself. And you might have seen its head poking out. And it kind of moves along, it pokes its head out. Eventually, this case caddisfly larvae, it will lose that casing and it will come out of the water and be a caddisfly which flies around here. Just like the true damselfly which I showed you earlier. That will one day leave the water and fly around like the dragonflies do, making this a wonderful place to be in summer with beautiful coloured damselflies and dragonflies flying around with the, caddisfly with the caddisflies as well. Now the other thing in here, I'm going to identify quickly for us now as well. Now there's some pictures here. I can look at this, these, picture, these pictures and compare it to what I've got. And I've got a pond snail. Um, there are also some ram's horn snails in my tray as well. They're a little bit more difficult to get off, in, off the floor of the tray because they're quite flat. Um, so I've left them there, I don't want to hurt them. So we've got in this tray, we've got here a pond snail and a cased caddisfly larvae. Fantastic. I'm so, I'm so, so thrilled that we found a cased caddisfly larvae. You are very lucky people. School children who visit us here at Preston Monthford and do the pond dipping always love to draw their favourite invertebrate. Sometimes we'll also add 
labels to it so that we can see exactly what our invertebrate looked like. Maybe it's a label for six legs or for the shell or for wings. We call this a scientific drawing. If you would like to complete one yourself, then look closely at your invertebrate, making sure it stays in the water because it needs to stay there for its own survival, and then do a nice drawing of your favourite invertebrate. Make sure that you put it back into, back into its habitat when you're finished. Now we're going to have to do a very important task right now, and that's to return these wonderful invertebrates back into our pond. We need to do this carefully, because if I just pour them in from a height, it'll be like dropping you off the Eiffel Tower. It's a long way for them to go, and they're going to hurt themselves. So to do that, I'm going to take this tray that, I was, that I've been using today back to the water's edge and crouch down and pour gently into the water from very close to the level of the water. Let's go do it. Now that was a look at the fantastic creatures in our pond. We'll see you a bit later for the making of the small ponds, but for now, back to you Lou. Thank you very much Bill and welcome back everyone. I have to say a big well done to Phil for not falling into that pond. It looked really, really icy around the edges. Now, Phil was super lucky to find one of my favourite freshwater invertebrates, and that was the lesser water boatman. As you saw, hopefully from this key that Phil was using, we have two different types of boatmen. We've got our lesser and our greater. Now, as Phil told us, the lesser swims on its front and the greater on its back. But this isn't the only difference between them. Now the lesser boatman is a herbivore, which means that it eats things that kind of like grow in the pond, such as algae, plants and other detritus. So whilst the lesser boatman is a friendly sort, you wouldn't want to be an invertebrate in a pond with the greater water boatman around. Now greater water boatmen are absolutely vicious hunters and predators. They can like fill the um, surface of the water for vibrations made by other insects, tadpoles and even fish. Once they feel a vibration, they swim incredibly quickly. They're like a lightning bolt that go across the water and they swim incredibly quickly like that on their backs using their oar like arms. And then they catch their prey. They inject it with toxic saliva using their sharp beaks. And once that prey is still, they don't eat it. They use an injection hole to then suck out its insides. So all you're left with is this exoskeleton of whatever invertebrate it found. So the lesser water boatman, really, really friendly, lovely herbivores. Greater water boatman, vicious and horrible. Now, Phil mentioned about drawing, oh, just to say actually about the greater water boatman, if you're pond dipping, don't worry, they can't eat you or suck the insides of your fingers out. You're much too big for them. I often get people quite worried about that. Now, Phil mentioned about drawing your favourite invertebrate. And here I've printed off the resource, back from today, resource pack from today's lesson. And I've had a go in the space at drawing that lesser water boatman that he saw. Now, you can do a lovely colour drawing if you would like to. But I have done something here that is known as a scientific drawing. Now, scientific drawings are really, really specific and they have a really specific set of rules. So if you would like to do one like that, if you search on YouTube for Fieldwork Live Habitat Exploration, you should find our live video from last year where I walk you through step by step on how to draw a scientific drawing. But I would love to see whatever drawings you do of our pond life. So with the help of an adult, you can share them onto Facebook, Instagram or Twitter using the hashtag Primary Nature Live. And then I'll try and show anything that you make in a later episode. Now, Angus has actually escaped from his box. He's being a bit of a pain today. He seems to be quite warm. Um, 
and he's going to join me for a few more shout outs. But before we do those, there was a really good question last time about tortoises that I missed. And that question was, what is their shell made out of? Now, the main part of his shell, I'm going to turn him around. He's not going to like me very much for doing it, which is this bit that we can see is made out of all of these different kind of like puzzle sections that connect together and they're known as scoots. Now these scoots are made out of keratin which is the protein that you can find in like your hair or in your nails and they're really really tough which provide Angus with lots of protection and they're kind of like anti-scratch so when he rams into things he doesn't get his shell all scratched up. They're not like armor though, they're not perfect. And you can probably see here on the back of Angus's shell, if I point to it, he's actually got a little dent. And unfortunately that was from when once upon a time when he was much, much, much smaller, he got attacked by a dog and the dog bit through his shell. But as you can see, he is perfectly fine now. Um, what was I talking about? Angus's shell. So the top of his shell then is made out of keratin. If we go under his shell, he then has another layer. He has an endoskeleton, which is made up of bones, similar to what we have. And then underneath this are his internal organs, like his intestines or his lungs. Okay, so his shell predominantly is made out of this really strong protein called keratin. Right, he is trying to run away. Let's do some more shout outs. So a big hello to Alison and everyone at May Place Primary School. I hear Alison that you've been really enjoying our live lessons. So thank you for watching and joining in. Um, we have some students from year five at St. Mary's Catholic Primary. Oh, we've also got Keston Primary School. If that is the Keston in Bromley near Keston Ponds, that is just around the corner really from where I grew up. Um, year one are here from Long Lane Primary School. We've got Emily, who is in year four at Williston C of E Primary in Cheshire. Uh, Mr. Welsh is here from Dingwall Primary School, all the way up in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, we have another St. Mary's actually, but this time from Yorkshire. And finally, we have Jasmine in year six at Martin Manor Primary, who as well has watched every single video so far. So thank you very much for that. I will do one more round of shout outs later on, all right? So let's go back to talking about our ponds. It's really, really important that we look after all of our ponds and try to create more as ponds are so important for two different reasons. The first reason is that they provide a fantastic habitat or home for species like the one Phil found or amphibians such as frogs, also birds. These are then eaten by other species such as perhaps our bigger birds. So without them, our food chains would struggle. The other reason is that ponds are brilliant at reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, therefore reducing the impacts of climate change. It has been found that some ponds can absorb more carbon than in woodlands, and seeing as they take up much less space means that they may be a more efficient method to help us with the current climate crisis. Now, lots of you are probably thinking, I'd love to have a pond, but I don't have enough space at school or in my garden. But actually, you don't need very much space at all. The size of a washing up bowl or plastic box will do. What we're going to do now is we're going to hand back over to Phil, who is going to explain how you could make your own mini pond at home or at school. So over to you, Phil. Thanks, Lou, and welcome back to FSC Preston Monford, everyone. Now earlier we showed you a few different creatures you can find in a pond. Now if you don't have your own pond we're going to show you now how to create a small pond for yourself that will fit in just a very small outdoor space. Right then we're going to have a go now at constructing our little pond. Now we're going to do this here at the, at the table inside just for ease of filming. At home you should do this in situ so you're not carrying around heavy objects full of water. So without further ado, what do we need to make our pond? Well, we're going to have a container, some gravel, uh, some stones, a plant part and of course still in that plant part, a small pond plant. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is put a layer of gravel or some small stones at the bottom. Not soil, otherwise your water will just get incredibly muddy. So I'm just going to do that right now. Okay. 
We also need to make sure that our little insects and other creatures can get in and out without just falling in. So to do that, I'm going to use some, some bricks and stones. You can use logs or twigs or whatever's appropriate for them to make some kind of some kind of staircase or ramp for them to get into. So just like this. Using whatever you've got at hand. I'm just gonna and a nice little stone at the top. And there we have it. Right, at this stage, we're going to take out what we've made so far, put it in the ground, and put an aquatic plant in it, and then fill it with water. Right then, I'm going to dig the hole now for our pond. Now, if you don't have space to actually dig a hole, or you don't have permission to dig a hole, you can just have the pond just sitting on the surface with stones or other material as a ramp up the side of it and around it. But now I'm going to go ahead and dig the hole, making sure I'm keeping my feet out of the way of the spade, and in. And And there we are, the, ho the hole for our pond. A mighty fine hole, even if I do say so myself. Right then, we've now put in the ground our pond. We just need to fill it with water and put the plant in there to provide a lovely habitat for some small invertebrates to go and live in. It's important to say that we must use rainwater in this, in this pond. Um, you can put a bucket outside and wait, or if you're lucky enough to own a rain butt, then take water from that rain butt. Please don't use tap water. Tap water has chemicals in that that are fine for humans to drink. In fact, we need them in there for us to have nice clean water, but they're not fantastic for the invertebrates and the plants that are going to be living in our pond. So make sure you use rainwater. So the only things that I left for us to do now are fill in the edges uh, with the soil that I've dug out so that things aren't falling in down the side, and to wait. We can wait and, and let the pond do its magic and bring the invertebrates towards it to live inside of it, and who knows, you might even get a frog. Thanks for visiting us here at Press and Monther today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly loved showing you all about our wonderful ponds and how to create your own. And back to learn Angus. Oh, that mini pond was brilliant. Thank you very much, Phil. If you want to make your own mini pond, I would suggest doing it at some point over the next few weeks, as this means you'll probably start to find things living in it, such as invertebrates, by the summer. For example, last year, my parents had a brand new pond built in January, and by the summer, we were watching newts swimming around and eating other things in the pond, and we had lots of water boatmen and things like that. Much like any drawings you do, once you have built your ponds, I would love to see them so that I can show them off in future episodes. So get an adult to help you share them on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook with the hashtag Primary Nature Live. We have some time now for a final round of shout outs and then I'm going to answer some of the questions that you have all been sending in and writing in the live chat. So first of all, we've got Shobden Primary School. We've got Belle and Thomas in Fulbeck, 
And we have, oh, they're all back. Lots of students from Tewton Mendip School are back again. Your teachers say that you're all wonderful and so are you all of your parents. So thanks for coming back, guys. Or oh, again, more like revisits. We've got Micah, Timmy and Yayan. They're all back. Hi, guys. Um, we've got Nash Mills C of E School from Hemel Hempstead. St Barnabas C of E Primary. Castle School in Pembrokeshire. Oh, we've got Zach and Noah from Wainwright Primary. And finally, we've got Paisley Holston from St. Monica's Catholic Primary. Oh, and a quick last one that's come in. We've got my pals, the Lewis family. So that is Jemima, Barnaby and Annabelle. Hey guys. So um, I've got some questions then that I've been sent in. So the first question is super relevant right now. What with all the snow and the cold weather? And that question is what happens to the animals in the pond when it freezes? Now, usually when a pond freezes, especially here in the UK, what happens is we get this top layer that freezes that's known as an ice cap. So this is where the top kind of like 30 to 50 centimeter of the pond freezes, but underneath that, it stays as water or as a liquid. This means that the bottom of the pond is still nice and liquidy and is probably a little bit warmer than at the top. So any fish or invertebrates that are living in the water, they will swim down to the bottom and stay there until all of that ice melts to stop them from freezing. So that's a nice relevant question. So the next one is then, what is the difference between a lake and a pond? Now, if you think of a lake, you'll probably think of something that's really, really big. And lakes tend to have much greater surface area than ponds, and they're much deeper and usually wider. Now, the biggest kind of scientific difference between them is that all of the water in the pond is what we call in the photic zone. So this is where the water is like shallow enough that every single bit will always get sunlight at the bottom. Lakes, however, have what we know as aphotic zones, which are really deep areas of water, which sometimes don't get any sunlight at all. And this then prevents things like plants from growing and then makes it very difficult for animals and things like that to live there. So that's the biggest difference between lakes and ponds. Ponds pretty much everywhere tend to get sunlight. Lakes, you have areas that are so deep, won't get any light at all. Um, the next question then is what pond animals are rare or endangered? Now I've got one here. This is my favorite one, if I can pick it up. There it is. Anyone know what that is? I'll give you a couple of seconds in the chat if you know what that is. So this guy here is known as a great crested newt and it is one of my favorite pond, pond animals. Now, whilst they are considered relatively common here in England, they have seen a huge decline in the last 60 years due to loss of like their habitats, the ponds, or due to those ponds becoming polluted. Now in England, we have like a really big portion of the world's population of great crested newts. And as a result of that, we have an international responsibility to protect them. This means that it is illegal to capture, kill, injure, or disturb them, or damage their habitat. Now, of the three newts that we can find here in England, they are the biggest by a long way and can grow up to 17 centimeters. The females will be bigger than the male because they have to carry a lot of eggs. Um, as you can see, probably from this picture, they are sometimes known as the warts newt because their skin is all bumpy and looks a little bit warty. And they look like mini dinosaurs, I think. Now, another fun fact about great crested newts is you can see that they are covered in all of these different spots. Now, a bit like how fingertips, each of these is unique to each of us. That is the same with newts. Each individual spots will be different and will be unique to them so it can help you to tell them apart. Now, although we think of great crested newts as being pond animals, they actually spend nine months of the year on land, hiding out in places like woodlands, grasslands, hedgerows and under logs and leaves. But they need those ponds in order to be able to go and lay some eggs and produce more. So there you are. That's my probably my favourite newt. That's favourite newt, favourite pond animal that is protected at the moment because I think they look really funny. They do. They look like mini dinosaurs. Um, our final question then is how do fish and invertebrates breathe underwater? Now, pond animals that spend all of their time underwater do not do not have lungs like you or I do. So they have to use different methods. 
One of these methods is they sometimes have these things down their sides known as gills. And what happens is as the water runs over the top of these gills, there's a process known as diffusion, which is where the oxygen from the water can separate and it passes through the skin in these gills into the animal. So that's one way that they get air or oxygen. The other way is some animals, I think a water scorpion does this, they're really, really clever and have developed essentially a snorkel, which means that every now and again, they have to come near the surface, pop that snorkel above the water, have a gasp of air, and then they can go back down again. Those were really good questions, guys. Some of those I found really tricky. The newt question, I had to message my friend Rachel who works with newts, so she gave me most of those fun facts. So big thank you to Rachel for helping me out there. Now, if you want to purchase any of our guides, such as this pond guide that Phil was using today, head over to our publications website where we have a huge range of things. Also, as I've mentioned a few times, these videos are put on for all of you for free and the FSC is a charity. So if you would like to make a donation to us, again, head over to our website and there's like obvious means there in order to do that. Also, if you have an adult with you, we would love it if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates about any future live lessons or so that you can easily find any past ones that you may have missed. Now, Angus and I, he's long gone. He's found some kale at the other side of the table. We hope to see you all again on Thursday, where we'll be heading up to North Wales to learn some wild skills, such as shelter building, knot tying, and how to make invertebrate traps to try and catch some terrestrial or land-based invertebrates. I've also heard a rumour that they're looking at some campfires as well. So from Angus and I, see you next time. Bye for now.